Hello dear, welcome back to my little prairie kitchen. I hope that you are well. I am very excited to share with you a new series that I have been planning for the last few months and was able to bring to life this past week. I have been wanting to create a series highlighting the American Girl historical dolls and their stories for a while now. I thought that it would be a wonderful way to connect these recipes from history as well as bring about some childhood nostalgia, giving us a chance to play again. Growing up, I was completely obsessed with American Girl dolls and The Pleasant Company. I am always hesitant to bring this up, but I actually own 13 American Girl dolls. As a child, they were the main gift that I received for every holiday and special occasion. I was a very meticulous caregiver for my dolls, and while they are certainly not fresh out of the box, they are very well taken care of, which made me want to share them with you even more. In this series, my hope is to recreate some of the scenery from these stories, of course with my own twists. I will be going through the American Girl historical character cookbooks and craft books, sharing my dolls and their accessories with you and hopefully inspiring some of you to go back in time to when you first enjoyed your own doll. I also must mention that I was very inspired to try making this series by the lovely Katie of Thistle Thistle who made a video recreating an outfit with her doll, and my friend Marie of Historical Belle also just started an American Girl cosplay series that you will have to check out. Both are linked in the description below. If you could not already tell, I will be showcasing Kirsten's story in this video. Kirsten is a young Swedish immigrant who travels by ship to America in 1854 and settles in Minnesota. The first recipe I will be making is Kirsten's potato soup. I thought that this recipe would be fitting for a winter supper as potatoes were the main ingredient that many families in the 19th century used to get them through the cold winter months. The original soup recipe is rather bland, which would be more realistic for the time period, especially if you were traveling by covered wagon. And while the soup boils, I'll bring out my doll to show you. This is my Kirsten doll. I believe she was purchased in 1999 or 2000. My first American Girl doll was Samantha, followed by Kirsten. This bed is a more recent find for me. It was for sale in a silent auction at a local thrift store, and I knew immediately that it was an American Girl doll bed. After a bit of research, I discovered that it was Addie's bed and dry sink, but it was being sold with Felicity's bedding. It took me a couple of weeks to finally get it after bidding. I have always loved this quilt. About three years ago, I made a replica twin size quilt, and I will have to show it to you in another video. Would you like to see what I have inside this box? This is all of my Kirsten accessories. But I don't think coconut and grace are supposed to be in here. Kirsten's lunchbox and food have hands down always been my favorite. Look at this Swedish tine box, it's just precious. The food was always my favorite as a kid, and I just love how much detail is put into every single piece.
I have Kirsten's cat, but I am missing the kitten, and I'm not sure where she got off to. This piece fascinated me as a child. It's Kirsten's tin foot warmer. The little tin bowl inside would have been filled with hot coals in real life to keep you warm on cold winter nights. As for Kirsten's school items, I am also missing the little sewn school bag and slate. It completely shocked my husband that they printed every single page in their little books. As you can see, the piece of cloth for wiping the slate was used many times. This is Kirsten's fishing basket. I'm pretty positive I threw away the fish. And this candlestick was a favorite piece as well. I still just like it a lot. Let's take a look at the meat outfit that we ended up recreating. I still have pieces missing that I will continue to work on, which I think makes this series a bit more fun. I have yet to sew the bonnet, but I did purchase the fabric for it. Kirsten's outfit also features these woven hair ribbons, a spoon bag with a handkerchief, I am missing the spoon, an apron, and the prairie dress. This quilted petticoat actually goes with her school outfit. As undergarments, she wears drawers and a chemise, and she has striped knit stockings and brown leather boots. The soup has finished cooking and it smells so wonderful, my dear friend. This soup is really like making very watery mashed potatoes, if you think about it. It would have made for a filling meal on nights when you were too cold and tired to make much else. I added some sour cream to thicken up the soup, as well as add some acidity. I'll fill up your bowl for you. Would you like some sharp cheddar cheese too? It will help to fill your belly along with this crust of bread. Shall we put Kirsten back to her original state? I must admit, I hardly ever took out her braids when I was young. I was too afraid that I would ruin her hair.
You're looking much better now. I did begin knitting the Kirsten socks, though I still have yet to finish them. The yarn is from my dear friend's local shop, and I shared the yarn brand and colors in the description. My mom helped me to make the dress, though I really only contributed in purchasing the materials and finding the pattern that I liked. The pattern is the 202 Day Dress with Yoke by Fig Leaf Patterns, and it's dated from 1856 to 1862. We tried our best to match fabrics with what we could find locally. The dress fabric is a Civil War reproduction quilting cotton. At first, Mom tried to follow the pattern directions as the dress would have been made in the 1850s. After a few trial runs, she decided to alter the pattern with modern sewing techniques. In the end, I think it turned out just perfect for its purpose. The bodice is lined inside and is meant to close with hooks. With the time constraints to make this video, it's currently being closed with pins and will hand sew in hooks later. For women of this time period, this dress is somewhat similar to a wrapper dress and it's very easy to put on. We chose to go with an adult version of Kirsten's outfit rather than an exact replica so that I could use it in other situations. We also wanted to make it usable on a daily basis. The length, however, is shortened to mimic the doll's dress. To recreate the outfit, I am using some pieces from my cottagecore wardrobe, which aren't period accurate, but they work for now. Pretty much nothing that I create is ever period accurate. The first layers are linen drawers from Little Women Atelier and a chemise from Varai. This 1860s gourd corset was kindly gifted to me from Red Threaded. This would be the period appropriate corset for women from Kirsten's time period. I am also wearing stockings and boiled wool and leather slippers as I am indoors. Now for the dress, which is put on kind of like a coat, though the skirt is not fully split in the front. The dress is actually made one size larger than my measurements, utter fear that it wouldn't fit properly when finished. Women in the 1850s would have worn a half apron or bib apron so that it could be easily removed when not needed. Children at the time wore a smock apron. Kirsten would have been just aging out of children's clothing and into clothing for young women. Creating the spoon pocket was truly magnificent because Kirsten and I have these same initials. During the cold winter months, it would have been imperative to have candles for light in the evenings. In Kirsten's craft book, it says that Kirsten had to dip candles 25 times to have enough wax to burn through one evening. So that is what we did. We have been making candles this way for many years, and it's always such a relaxing craft. Thankfully, we do not need candles, so it is more of a winter tradition to practice and time to spend together with my mom.
The next recipe I'll be making is an adapted version of Kirsten's St. Lucia buns. I shared a lot of history about St. Lucia Day in my blog post with this recipe and it's really a fascinating look at where holiday traditions come from. To begin, you will need one cup of milk, a third cup of sugar, and a half cup of butter. Heat until the milk is just warm and then remove from heat and let the butter melt. Then whisk together two cups of all-purpose flour with one tablespoon of yeast, one and a half teaspoons of salt, one vanilla bean, and a quarter teaspoon of saffron threads. Then add the milk mixture and stir until the mix is no longer dry. Add two large eggs and whisk them in next. Then add the remaining two and a half cups of flour until a soft dough forms that no longer clings to your hands. Knead the dough for about eight minutes or until it is smooth and elastic. Then place the dough into a lightly greased bowl and cover it with a towel until it doubles in size, about one to one and a half hours. Before lighting your candles, they do need to cure for at least 24 hours. For the sake of this video, we decided to light a couple right away. However, please do not light your candles next to greenery like I did for this 5 seconds of video, as this is a fire hazard. Next, we'll be making Kirsten's Blue Stenciled Box. This box is a replica of a Swedish tine box. Tine boxes were oval or rectangular shaped wooden boxes that were painted with Swedish stenciling. This was often inspired by nature as well as hearts and horses. We thought it would make a lovely gift box. It's now time to shape the buns, dear. St. Lucia buns come in many different shapes. For this version, we will be making the Gold Wagon or the Golden Wagon shape. The Jewel Galt or the Christmas Pig is the traditional shape that you might see. A large part of my own heritage comes from Sweden and Denmark. I find that Kirsten's story really resonates with me on a personal level, as my own family traveled to the United States in a similar fashion and made their way to the very town that I still live in today. But because these traditions were not passed down in our family, 
I am often left to find my own way to connect with my ancestors, and one of the most tangible ways to do that is through food. The raisins are meant to be the cat's eyes. <laughs> These will bake for about 20 minutes at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. While the buns are baking, let's put together a little pioneer Christmas gift. If you are familiar with Little House on the Prairie Friend, you might remember the story of when Laura is sure that Santa Claus will forget them in their little log cabin in a terrible blizzard. She and her sister are filled with joy when they receive the gifts of a tin cup, peppermint stick, heart-shaped cake dusted with white sugar, and a penny. This little gift is inspired after what real pioneer children might have received on their holiday. I packed up some pieces of peanut brittle, an embroidered ornament, a hand-carved wooden toy, and a little gingerbread cookie. We'll tuck this all away in some calico fabric and share it with you, my friend. I hope that you like it. The buns are fresh out of the oven and they smell divine. The saffron colors them a lovely yellow color like the sun, and the warm raisins are just sheer perfection. These would be so yummy with some cinnamon butter. I hope that you enjoyed joining me in the kitchen and our farmhouse here on the Iowa Prairie. It was such a pleasure to put together this video and begin our first series here on the channel. I hope to showcase more of Kirsten's story as well as my other historical dolls. As always, I hope that you have a lovely weekend cooking in your own cozy cottage kitchen, dear. If you would like to support me, you can shop our digital magazines and ebooks on my website, as well as subscribe to our channel and like this video. I'll see you here next Friday, my dear. Goodbye.